Hey guys, this is David Villa, another episode of GC Talks. Today I'm gonna talk about the real measure of leader effectiveness. All right, we live in a world that is absolutely obsessed with metrics. We measure everything. A leader's success is often measured by market share, revenue growth, and and meeting profit projections. This obsession leads to an emphasis on immediate results, but at the expense of long-term sustainability. I call this focus on short-term results the tyranny of the quarterly. In spite of this focus, a substantial body of research demonstrates that a leader's impact on these metrics is indirect at best. It's, it, I, I'm going to go as far as to say it's not accurate. It's not right. The evidence indicates that the impact a leader has on the traditional outcomes is accomplished by first building the capacity of their followers, both as individuals and as a team. So the real measure of a leader is not the indirect impact they have on the numbers, but the direct impact of changing the lives of those who follow them. So Paul understood this, and a life change was the standard that he evaluated his effectiveness as a leader by. So for him, life change occurred on two interrelated levels. First, there's the change that occurs when people turn to God, right? When they become Christ followers in response to the preaching of the gospel. Paul had a clear understanding that he had been called to preach the gospel in order that we should turn and those that he preached to would turn from their vain things to living for God. His ordained mission was to take the gospel message to the Jews and Gentiles alike, to open the eyes of those that followed him that he preached to so they can turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of the enemy, to, from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they can receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ. Acts 26, 18 talks about this. So we see this in, in the Thessalonians who turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. In making this change, they become imitators of us and the Lord and became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and and everywhere that they were were affiliated. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, 7, they were changed when they abandoned idols and they turned to the true living God. But this initial transformation is only the beginning. The second level of life change involves the ongoing transformation of developing Christ-like character. Paul prayed that his followers would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Think about that for a second. Filled with the knowledge of God's will. So it's hard sometimes to even understand what God's will is, right? But Paul preached this. And as we, as we plug into Jesus, leaders, he'll show us what his true will is. And, and, that, and Paul preached this, that people that, that found this truth would, that would provide them the wisdom and understanding they needed to walk in a manner that was worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's Colossians 1, 9, 10. So it was with this goal in mind that he labored, striving according to the power of the Spirit within him to present every follower complete in Christ. Paul measured his leadership by both the initial change and the ongoing change of the lives of those who followed. Look, I want you to reflect on this, right? Ask these questions. How is leader effectiveness measured in your context? What pressure do you feel to make your numbers? How might your leadership effectiveness be enhanced if you were to shift your focus to building the capacity of your team? Let's look at it from the standpoint of affirmation, affirming but not being content. An important aspect of the legacy leadership process is the affirmation of a person's character and the appreciation for their individual contributions. Paul was exuberant in expressing his passionate love and appreciation for those that he had the privilege of leading. He thanked God every time he remembered the Philippians, the Colossians, the Thessalonians. He referred to them as his joy, his crown, as his glory. You can read Philippians 4, 1, Thessalonians 2, 19, 20. He affirmed the followers' faith their love, and their hope. He acknowledged the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, their good works, and the impact they had for Jesus' sake in their immediate communities and beyond. Paul was affirmational, but he was not content. In his opening prayer for Philippians, he prayed that their love would abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere, blameless until the day of Christ. The Lord had begun a good work in their lives and Paul was pleased with their growth, but he prayed their love and joy would grow even more. He was affirming, 
but he wasn't content. That's powerful right there. As leaders, we have to affirm those that follow. Listen, we might have arrived, and many of us think maybe we've arrived more than maybe we have, but the reality is that we can't be content. So Paul commended the Thessalonians for their faith, their love and hope, the three marks of authentic Christ followers, yet he was not content, and he refused to allow anyone to become complacent. In 1 Thessalonians 4.1, he affirms that they are walking and pleasing God as they should, but then he tells them to excel still more. Later in the same chapter, he commends them for their love of the brethren, but urges them to excel still more. I, I want to stop and I want you to just think about this for a second. When Paul talked about in, in the scriptures and he said, you know, I have, I have not arrived yet, right? I haven't counted myself to have apprehended. I, I haven't gotten there yet. But this one thing that I do, I forget, right, what's behind me and I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I want you to understand that Paul knew what it was like and knew what it meant to affirm and be affirmed, but not to be content. I want to point this out when Paul later on, you know, we, we, I thought about this the other day when Paul said that I've finished the race, right? At the end of his life, when I finished the race, I've, I've made it. Sometimes, you know, I've thought of that often in, in the past and in, 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 I had a perception that, you know, Paul was like, man, I made it. Man, hey, listen, I, I just, I've arrived. But I, I actually think that he was just going about the journey, affirming, right, his walk with Christ. God was affirming in him. Hey, listen, you're, you're, you're growing in me. But the, the fact that he wasn't content and he was always trying to just grow and, and move to that next level in Christ, I think that as he was going along that journey, all of a sudden, I look at it this way. I've made it. Man, I've finished this race. I, I've, I've arrived here. And it was almost like a humble aspect because he was just going about doing the work of God. So here's the thing. Evidently, the Thessalonians took this to heart because Paul commends them again in the opening of his second letter. He said, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you towards one another grows even greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly, he said, of you among the churches of God for your perseverance of faith in the midst of all your persecutions, afflictions, which you endure. And then he said, as, a, as proud as he was of their growth and progress, he still encouraged them to not grow weary of doing good. Think about this for a second. It doesn't matter if you really sat down with most leaders and if they opened up their life as a book, which a lot of them don't do. But if you opened up the life and you say, hey, let me just, let me just really talk to you about your journey. I, I, I think that if we're honest as leaders, even though we might have accomplished some things, we have not arrived. Even though we might have some, some, some trophies and some things that we can uh, emulate success and somebody goes, you know, hey, that there's success there. If we really viewed this and, and, and had the transparency into a leader's life, they would tell you, and I'm here to tell you, that even though we've made some strides, we can't get weary in doing good. Because look, the enemy's always going to try to distract. He's always going to try to take us out as leaders. But there's a recurring pattern of affirmation and exhortation in Paul's leadership. He provided a dynamic balance between challenging his followers to grow and acknowledging their progress. He was affirming, but never content. So maintaining the balance between affirmation and challenge is crucial. If we are always challenging but never recognizing achievements, we risk driving our followers to resentment, burnout, or even quitting. And look, I'm going to say this. We have a, an epidemic of quitting in the body of Christ. We start things, but we don't finish them. And if we want to finish them, we need to plan for, generate, and celebrate the wins. Let the achievements sink in bask in them for a while. Stop. Smell the roses. Give God glory for what he's done. Be grateful. Be happy. Recognize. Think on these things, Paul said. But then, then consolidate those gains and use them as fuel to excel still more and press on to the next challenge. We must affirm and appreciate the contributions of others, yet not allow them or ourselves to become complacent. You know, my grandparents had this pond that I was growing up and, you know, it was a koi pond, but there was no koi in it. And, you know, it had, and, and I didn't really understand when I was a kid that it was a koi pond. I look back now and recognize that's what it was, but it was, it was, you know, probably a couple of years without any koi in it. And it was just unattended. And I remember walking around this pond as a kid and I remember looking at it and my grandmother would say, watch out, you're going to fall into this. And sure enough, multiple times over my young life, I fell into that and, and, and got gunk and, and slime on me. And it had this smell. It was, it was stagnant. There was not anything living in this water. There was no life in this water. And I'm going to tell you, there's a huge difference between that 
dried up, old, stagnant koi pond in a life-giving river that you step into that water and you know what? You might get wet in both scenarios, but the river's moving. It's constantly, you don't step into the same body of water every time you step into a river that's moving. There's life there. It's moving. So look, don't allow yourself to become stagnant. Always affirm, but never be content. So I want to give you these few things here as we wrap this episode up. Reflect on these, right? And act on these questions. Here you go. Where have you allowed complacency as a leader to creep in? Think about that. Are, are, are you given everything you have? Are you, do, is your vision still sharp? Do you need to go back and revise your vision, revisit your vision? Where have you allowed complacency to creep in? What new challenges need to be addressed? You know, is what, it, it, did you stop doing what you used to do? Or have you started doing some things that you need to stop doing? Is there stinking thinking that's, that's kind of creeped into your mind? So what new challenges need to be addressed? Because I, I promise you this, every challenge that we face as leaders require us to get into and face that challenge newly and, and, and face that challenge head on as it is today because every challenge is different. So how about this one? Where do you need to celebrate a win today? Do you have wins? Are you giving yourself the pat on the back that you need? Are you even acknowledging the victory that God brought into your life? You know, some of the ways that I address challenges today is I remember a past victory. When I remember a past victory, it's, it, 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 it increases my faith. It, it, it brings new life to my faith. So the enemy would love to have you forget about the fact that God brought you through those past victories. But today, I challenge you, celebrate that win. So where do you need to celebrate a win today? Here's the last question I want to leave you with. Where do you need to build on a win and press on? So sometimes we create plateaus or we, you know, we get to a place and I, and I get it. Look, you, you get to a place, you pushed and you get a victory and you celebrate. But sometimes we hang out there too long. And before you know it, it's a year or two down the road and we're still living on that yesterday win. So here's my question. Celebrate the win. But where do you need to build on a win? Where do you need to press on in that win? Because look, if you if you set up camp and it's not just a tent where you can, you can stay there and have some shelter while you enjoy it. But now you've built a structure that you didn't need to build. God didn't ever design you to, to build a permanent dwelling right there in this place because there's higher levels to reach. So where do you need to build on a win and press on? I'm hoping this challenged you today. So look, be, be, con- be uh, affirmed, but not content. Be affirmed but not content. Listen, don't measure with the same measuring stick that you think the world is going to measure with. Don't look at it the same way. God has a measuring stick just for you, and he's affirming you today as a leader, but he's also challenging you to press on to new horizons. Thank you.